Good morning. It's Thursday and the 1st of June and I'm Govind Raj Athiraj with the core report coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital and still the most rocking city in the world. Here are our two quick reports and theme the hmm section and two conversations of the day where we get a status check on India's economy going forward and an insight into SEBI's new consultation paper. And here are our top stories. India's economy surprises with a 7.2% GDP growth. Vedanta's $19 billion chip project in Gujarat runs into delays with the government likely to reject its first application. A move triggered by the Adani Hindenburg research report, India's SEBI releases a consultation paper saying high-risk foreign portfolio investors must disclose more about themselves. Hmm, and more about Hadani. An auditor refuses to qualify a business partner as unrelated because it probably feels it is actually related. This is a core report with Govindraj Athiraj. India's GDP hit 7.2%. India's full year gross domestic product is estimated at 7.2% for the last financial year or 22-23, a number that has actually been speculated, hinted as well as projected in recent weeks by various government functionaries. The previous full year was 9.1% thanks mostly to a low base triggered by COVID and a constrained economy. For the latest quarter, the economy grew at 6.1%. Figures released by the government's Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation showed on Wednesday evening. Breaking the numbers down further, manufacturing grew 1.3% after growing over 11% in the previous year. Agriculture, forestry and fishing grew at 4% in contrast to the 3.5% growth in the previous year. Trade, hotels, transport, communication and other services grew 14% after growing a shade under 14% in the previous year. The numbers are still somewhat fresh, but I managed to seek out a first cut analysis on the headline numbers when I caught up with Crystal Chief Economist DK Joshi. And my first question was, did this 7.2% number beat expectations? DK, thank you very much for joining us. So, 7.2% GDP estimated for the full year 22-23. Is that a surprise? Yeah, it's a positive surprise. And I think it is telling you that economy did better than you expected uh, earlier. And also the last year's numbers had been revised up. So this is over a stronger base. So this shows a pretty strong performance of the economy in 22-23. And which part of it was a surprise? As in, uh, if, if you were to break that down further into agriculture, non-agriculture, Well, agriculture has done extremely well at 4% GDP growth, which is above the trend rate of growth over a higher base. And services, because we all know they are rebounding, particularly in urban areas, I think that has also contributed quite significantly. Uh, Construction activity has been pretty strong in the fourth quarter. So I think these are the surprises for the fourth quarter, because fourth quarter GDP was earlier estimated at 5.1%. It came in at 6.1%. So that lifted the overall annual GDP growth. And these numbers are stronger than what the government itself had projected? Absolutely. And just to drill down the specifics again, you're saying construction is the biggest surprise, as in what's caused the switch? Well, construction has been doing well. It's doing it's showing better growth right now. Agriculture in the fourth quarter grew at 5.5%. That is a big surprise, I think, and that lifted the overall agriculture growth up. And I think apart from that, the rebound in services was already known. So that doesn't come as a surprise. I think some uh, growth could have been anticipated slightly lower earlier that moved moved up a bit. Uh, and consumption activity, private consumption is also reasonably strong, I mean, in this, in this estimate. So I think overall, there are some movers, but in general, the performance in the fourth quarter has lifted uh, the overall GDP. And if you were to look at what the numbers were before COVID to now, what kind of contrast would you draw? Well, I think we are seem to be back on the pre-COVID growth trajectory, which is the decadal growth rate of 6.7% that we had. So we seem to be moving towards that trajectory. But still, I would say that GDP level in 22-23 will still be lower than what it would have been without the pandemic. So there is there is a permanent loss of growth that has happened. And if you were to look at the rest of the year, how are things looking? A projection outward? 
Uh, we expect economy to slow down to 6%, I think, for two reasons. One is the spillover effect of global slowdown, which is going to hit our exports. It's already hitting our exports, and so that is going to spill over to the manufacturing activity that cater to those exports. And second is the central bank has been raising interest rates, and the objective is to control inflation. But before uh, the rate hikes control inflation, they have to slow the GDP growth. So I think some impact, lagged impact of rate hikes will also be felt on growth. So both these will, will slow the economy to 6%. 6% is still a pretty reasonably uh, good rate of growth because it's the highest in G20 economies. Right. And by the end of this year, we would have completely normalized for pre-COVID to COVID? Yeah, we are above the pre-COVID levels. I think it's just that that we are lower than where we would have been without the pandemic. I mean, so as far as the level of activity is concerned, today GDP growth is much higher than what it was in 2019. But if no pandemic were there, GDP would have been uh, much higher than where it is today. So it's I'm talking of the trend trajectory of GDP growth, not the pre-COVID level. Chris's chief economist, D.K. Joshi, saying that this year will not be as good given that there are strong global headwinds and early signs like lower exports. And where will the chips land? Vedanta Foxconn's $19 billion semiconductor chip project may not get government incentives to make 28 nanometer chips. Now, the project apparently does not meet the criteria for getting government assistance, which runs into billions of dollars and can make the difference between stop and go for the project in its current form. Vedanta Resources and Taiwan's Hontai Precision Industry can apply again, but a rejection would mean delays, Bloomberg News has reported. While Hontai makes a significant chunk of the world's iPhones, it and nor does Vedanta have any real experience in chip making, for which the project needs a technology partner or licensed manufacturing grade technology for these 28 nanometer chips. The government actually had pledged $10 billion to help chip makers, promising it would bear half the cost of setting up all semiconductor sites, says Bloomberg. Now, Vedanta had earlier said that Hontai had secured production grade high volume 40 nanometer technology, but development grade technology for the more sophisticated 28 nanometer chips. So what is this 28 nanometer chip? From what I can make out, Taiwan's TSMC, the big chip giant, has been making 28 nanometer chips for over 10 years. These chips support applications ranging from central processing units or CPUs in computers to graphic processors, high-speed networking chips, smartphones, tablets, home entertainment, consumer electronics, and so on. Now, this gives you a sense on why this particular category is relevant and perhaps critical to a growing market like India and its hunger for many devices, led, of course, by smartphones. 40 nanometer chips are a little older, launched by TSMC in 2008, and a little slower compared to 28 nanometer chips, going by some of the tech journals that I glanced through. TSMC itself has been pushing customers to switch to 28 nanometers, with one journal saying that they are not expanding manufacturing of 40 nanometer and instead focusing on 28. Now, it's possible that Vedanta and the government of India have good reasons to stay focused on the 40 nanometer sector. And they feel that this is more appropriate for Indian markets and the production cycle. But the reasons are not very clear to me right now. The government is likely going to ask Vedanta Hontai to apply fresh in this category. The big foreign portfolio investment loophole. India's market regulatory body, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, says foreign portfolio investors or FPIs who have a substantial portion of their investments concentrated in a single Indian company will have to make additional disclosures according to a consultation paper released on Wednesday. The language of the consultation paper is actually quite revealing. It says that the objective of this exercise is to foster and enhance trust and transparency and greater investor protection in the Indian securities market, thus hinting that trust and transparency levels are either low or have recently fallen. No doubt, this is a direct outcome of the Adani Hindenburg report saga, wherein the latter, a New York-based research house and short seller, claimed that Adani Group company stock was owned by very few investors and alleging that they were somehow linked to each other and then finally to the owners themselves. Many market watchers, including myself, have felt that the problem in this issue was not whether there were some strange corporate entities sitting overseas holding Adani Group stock in India, though that could be a problem in itself, 
but more importantly, the utter lack of transparency of them and no one being able to pierce the corporate wheel, so to speak. SEBI now says that high-risk investors will have to reveal more. Such FPIs shall be required to provide granular data of all entities with any ownership, economic interest or control rights on a full look-through basis up to the level of all natural persons and or public retail funds or large public listed entities. Now, going by data as of March 31st, 2023, SEBI has estimated that about $31 billion or 2.6 lakh crore or 6% of total FPI equity assets under management and less than 1% of India's total equity market capitalization could fit this high-risk FPI category. So you may understand what the high risk is if you understand or see the low and moderate risk. Now, low and moderate risk categories are people like sovereign funds, which are typically owned by governments like Singapore or Abu Dhabi, central bank funds, and then other funds like pension or public retail funds with a diverse investor base. Many of them would be brands that you would have heard of because they are typically attached to or part of other banking systems. From my own understanding, SEBI has always sought to register portfolio investors who have that diverse investor shareholding. But obviously, in recent years, there has been some relaxation in keeping with the rising demand for greater liberalization in inflows, as long as the entities who were investing from outside India were not involved in some nefarious activity. So these entities or companies can invest in India, but by first registering themselves first as FPIs with SEBI. Individuals, by the way, are not still permitted to invest directly into this country. For example, you could invest in the US markets and buy stock of Apple or Intel sitting right here in India, but not the other way around. But the wording of the consultation paper is quite shocking in a way, given that it acknowledges indirectly what has been suspected for a while, that some FPIs have been observed in SEBI's words to concentrate a substantial portion of their equity portfolio in a single investing company and company group. And in some cases, these concentrated holdings have been near static and maintained for a long time. Such holdings raise various regulatory concerns, SEBI says. Now, the hope, of course, is that SEBI goes through with the proposals mentioned in this paper and goes further to bring about greater transparency as everyone has been seeking. Any step otherwise will fail to address the key issue plaguing Indian markets, particularly for foreign investors, in SEBI's own words, trust and transparency. Such holdings raise various regulatory concerns, SEBI says. So to understand a little more about what this consultative paper has been driven by, and to understand how the market views it, I'm joined by well-known analyst Ambarish Baliga. Ambarish, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm trying to follow up on this uh, new consultation paper that the SEBI has released on um, investors or foreign portfolio investors having to make more disclosures. So what does this mean? Tell us about the background. So I think uh, this whole thought process, SEBI must have started uh, post the Adani Hindenburg saga. But then this has been going on in the Indian markets for quite a long time. I mean, a couple of decades, if I'm not wrong. In the markets, basically, investors make money, but the promoters generally create wealth, and that too only on books, because uh, typically a promoter does not sell his holding, unless it's a takeover or a sell-off. So whatever the promoter is holding, whether it's 75% or 50% or even 35%, any transaction in the promoter holding is closely watched by the markets, and uh, generally selling by promoters is not really taken well by investors. So, I mean, how does the promoter make money from the stock markets? since uh, his equity holding only sh uh, I mean, shows uh, paper profits. So many promoters park their market holdings with friends, relatives, or known people, or professional uh, warehousing entities. So when the stock moves up, they sell and profit out of it, and nobody really gets to know about it. And this parking also ensures that there is lower real free float in the market, and the manipulation actually gets that much easier. In case a real interest is generated in the market, then these uh, shares are sold off or offloaded to the buyer. And I mean, everyone concerned is quite happy. But this is fine as long as the market cap of the company is about 2,000, 3,000 crores or below that. But when it goes beyond, then the whole thing gets much more professional. And that's the time you need an overseas warehousing entity. And that becomes the FPI. And when an FPI name appears on the shareholder list, it automatically adds some value sentimentally. I think people who have been in the market do understand this. And when we actually check the FI, FPI's other holdings, then we clearly see that it is concentrated in one or two stocks or a maximum of eight to 10 stocks. But the intention is clearly to warehouse and you know I mean, what game is going on. So I think this step taken by SEBI, it's quite welcome. 
But at the same time, I'm quite sure that these guys who are involved in this will surely find a way out. Possibly a bunch of FPIs will come together and possibly hold 25-30 stocks among themselves with the same uh, intention of warehousing and there will not be too much of concentrated holding. And But you're saying there are professional warehousing entities? Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you look around, you'll always find people willing to do that for you. Okay. It's beyond the scope of today's discussion to ask you more on that. But let me ask you a more generic question. One is you're saying that people are totally aware of this. So in a way, it's factored into prices, into behavior and so on. But what if tomorrow there are disclosures and it emerges that there were a certain set of entities who were holding or were behind these FPIs who in turn were holding shares in only these companies and for long periods of time as SEBI itself has uh, suggested in this consultative paper? Uh, see, for this uh, consultative paper to become a sort of a diktat or a rule by SEBI, I think will they will take a while. And I suppose that gives enough time to all these people to get things right. Uh, so... I don't think it will really I mean, have a major disruption as such. And before the D-Day, I think uh, most of these people will, will put their uh, books in order. Hmm. The Adani Group again. So the Adani Group owned Adani Ports and Special Economic Zone has an interesting problem. Its auditor, the well-known Deloitte Haskins and Cells, has raised concerns on Tuesday over the ports transaction with three companies. Now, to start with, it is unusual for a top auditor to issue a qualification like this. Now, the qualification goes as follows. Adani says that these companies were unrelated to it, while the auditor says it could not confirm the same and the firm, presumably Adani, refused to get an independent external examination that would help prove so, according to Bloomberg News. Now, these transactions include an engineering contract with a subsidiary of a company identified in the Hindenburg report from whom $453 million was recoverable. Deloitte was told by Adani that this contractor is not a related party. The revelation in itself could be dismissed as something that could be managed in the realm of accounting, except that it comes in the wake of Hindenburg Research's allegations of stock manipulation and accounting fraud, something SEBI is of course looking into right now and a report is awaited. Well, that's it from me on this Thursday morning. See you tomorrow, same time. Have a great day ahead. This was the core report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.